Hello, welcome to our uh, first webinar on the subject of augmented reality. Uh, it's a big subject, and so I'm uh, very delighted to be able to introduce it today in a very preliminary way, first hour, primarily for people who are new to the concept. And um, then in, uh, in the future, I can get into more details and, and explore new avenues around uh, augmented reality. So welcome, everyone. I'd like to start off by asking you, if you have not already done so, to put yourself on mute so that if you have any unexpected calls or noises in your environment, it won't be an interruption to everyone else. So thank you for muting yourself. Um, again, uh, it's a pleasure and welcome. My name is Christine Pere. I'm an independent consultant. And a lot of people um, wonder what, what that exactly means and what I do, because I call myself a spine wrangler. So uh, what is a spine? It's the conjunction of space and time. It's a concept that uh, was coined by a man named Bruce Sterling uh, to, to ex explain that in the future we're going to have uh, objects in space, they're physical objects, but they have a, a notion of time. And this is a, a, an emerging area. So I've put a picture here with lots of waves and chaos, and I want to communicate to you that this is a, um, a very chaotic landscape in which I do research. And I do technology research, trying to stay uh, abreast of the trends. And I also help, uh, I study companies and how they're responding to the changes in technologies and the awareness of, of spines. So um, this allows me, based in building upon the landscapes, I can start initiatives and help um, other organizations with their strategies. And that's exactly uh, what I'm delighted to be doing here today with the IEEE ESA. And our goals are to have measurable impacts on people and businesses and to make the world a better place. So that, with that as an introduction about what I do, I think I'll go ahead and uh, now uh, share with you what we're going to be doing for the rest of this time. The purpose of this webcast is to just get you oriented and in the domain of augmented reality, and that's going to uh, be broken up into these three parts. I'll be introducing some language. I'm not going to give you a term and a definition. I'm going to use the language, and uh, gradually I think you'll understand how these uh, terms work together. I'll also be um, giving you some background or some, some context about um, AR within a larger internet and communications and technology. Uh, domains, and, and uh, I'll be speaking about how augmented reality experiences are made and where you can go to uh, experience them yourself. All right, so uh, I like to say that augmented reality always needs to begin with the user. The user is in the middle. Fundamentally, the user is what augmented reality is about. It's a user interface. It allows people human beings to, enter, to experience the world differently. And it always requires some hardware. I know it's hard to believe, but it does always require a piece of hardware. It could be um, some projectors. It could be smartphones, tablets, uh, or even wearable technology, some hardware that has some sensors in it. Um, I will get into that in a second. And also to display or to communicate media, digital information to the user. So one of the things that the hardware has in it or enables is a detection of the user's context. So where is the user's geospatial context and what are the objects that are around it, surrounding that user that might be um, uh, a focus of attention. But we shouldn't eliminate or disregard the possibility that there are sounds that provide context or taste and touch. There are many different components of our senses that can be detected and incorporated and communicated um, through our, our hardware. And then once you have that 
You combine it with content and infrastructure. Content digital information usually is in the cloud or on a network somewhere, but it can also be hosted directly on the local system of the user. And there's often a, an element of infrastructure for communication between the content and the sensors and the user. And together, all these combined can, can modify the user's perception of reality using digital information that's synchronized with the world, synchronized with the physical world around it. Now, what does that exactly look like? Well, it's not even going to look exactly like what I'm going to describe to you, but I'll give you an example. This is my daughter. She's uh, sitting on a, on a bench uh, oh, looking over Lake Geneva, and she's got a, a smartphone in her hand, and it's full of sensors. And these uh, are taking readings and sending them up, and they're being analyzed by a service in the cloud, and then some digital information is being brought back to the user, and that can be overlaid on the screen of the smartphone in real time. And that could constitute um, place names, for example, as I've got, given you an example here, or it could also be graphics. Um, this is a graphic that might be an imaginary game that's associated with that, uh, that tower below. Um, and then there might also be the detection of a boat on the lake. And that might use a camera to detect the boat's uh, shape and then match the shape with um, a catalog and, and, and agenda. So it tells us when, the, in, when that boat is going to be arriving at its destination where we can meet it. So this is an example of both geospatial augmented reality and computer vision-based AR. Now, AR is, sounds like a really new idea, but it's actually been around for um, many years, uh, 50 years approximately. Um, even some argue it's been around 100 years. People have had this concept of combining information that comes from somewhere else. Uh, we didn't really have the concept of computers 100 years ago, but certainly at the time of Ivan Sutherland, and he had this uh, contraption that he created with his graduate students, and, and um, actually I think he was a graduate student at the time, and he described how he could see the physical world how his context within that physical world was detected, and then there were drawings that were uh, appearing in front of his eyes. And this uh, later became known as augmented reality when in the early 90s, someone, uh, these gentlemen, Tom Caudell uh, and Associates, uh, published a, a paper about the use of augmented reality at Boeing. And then in some years later, a short while later, people began to uh, describe different zones or set the use of augmented reality uh, in a spectrum, a continuum between the entirely physical world and the entirely virtual world. And so they began to define more frameworks uh, for how to better understand uh, the context. Then um, this, I have listed a few of the highlights of, of people and the dates when different definitions were introduced and proposed. And I think what's important here is only that augmented reality is evolving. Um, it doesn't uh, stay stationary, and I, I suspect it will continue to evolve in the future. But one of the milestones in that series was when Ron Azuma published a paper. Uh, it was a review, a state-of-the-art review, and uh, he he stipulated that only technologies that could combine the real and the virtual in real time and respond uh, to changing conditions that were registered in 3D would be included in his review. And that's, that's uh, certainly uh, his prerogative, and it's one that the research community adhered to for many, many years. Well, uh, the research community uh, was and remains very important to the future of augmented reality, but it's not the only driving force. It's not uh, um, the only uh, information, the source of information that we can use to, to learn why augmented reality is relevant. People, human beings, whether it's all stages of life, uh, regardless of where they are at work or at home or um, in a sports venue, wherever they are, 
they're surrounded by digital information these days. And I think it's uh, just a fact that we, we are in that uh, immersive, immersed in digital information continuously. And this is leading us to, um, to change our behaviors, to change our expectations. Um, in addition to having the, the digital information accessible, so readily accessible, we're also more and more accustomed to digital data being in a, available in a variety of formats. So the, the data formats are diversifying. They're becoming um, more um, varied. And we, we can also realize, we can also detect that the units of information are changing in size. So, you know, a very long time ago and in, in my lifetime, information was primarily uh, measured through books and pages, and uh, then it became commonplace to think of, augment, uh, think of digital information as being a, a blog post or a, maybe a, a web page, and then it became smaller, um, and, you know, now people use tweeting for transmitting information. But each of these um, units just gets smaller and smaller, as does our perception of space. That's the spaces around us. We can define spaces in small and smaller ways. And our perception of time is also getting more sensitive, where um, we are able to detect uh, very, very small units of time. Maybe not unassisted, but with our assisted devices, we are able to, um, to detect these. And these changes are also reflected in our devices, the devices that for the last five years we have been seeing that the, the smartphone is getting more and more and more and more capabilities embedded into it, and it's more and more powerful, connected to an ever larger uh, network of content and resources, the cloud we call it. But at the same time, what's begun to happen over the last, uh, I think, less than a year, is a fragmentation of that. I think we've turned a corner and we're starting to see that people are, are uh, their minds are open to having intelligent uh, surfaces or devices that are speaking to one another in the machine-to-machine -machine, um, uh, world. And that as a result, what we're seeing is a, a situation where people um, may not ha be holding a single device in the future. They may have a display on their head and a um, computing center in their pocket and uh, something else on their wrist or on their garments. So this is um, very, very much consistent with what the uh, Google Advanced Technology Projects are doing these days. And there's a project called ARA, A-R-A, in which um, the phone, the smartphone or the feature phone that we had before, is being taken apart and personalized. So now I don't have to have the same exact uh, configuration as the next person. And we can now customize and personalize our computing and communications devices. This is a very, very important trend because it's what exactly has led us to understand we can have different devices for different venues, for different circumstances. So if I'm in the home, I might want a large sound system. When I'm outside and, and uh, it, maybe in a sports situation, I want a very lightweight device uh, for, for sound and, and uh, other information. When I'm at work, I have the ability to use a different, piece, uh, different computing and com communications platform. And what this is doing is it's allowing us to customize and to obtain information and data in context. So now we can perhaps communicate with objects differently because they're in a different venue. We communicate differently with people because we have different relationships with them. And the attributes of the information that we use or we desire also differs according to the venue. And what this is doing is making us as society and making everyone more sensitive to the kinds of information that they receive and wanting just the right information, not more, not less, just when we need it. And this is what I call a, sort of the personal knowledge universe. It's an infinitely large uh, amount of information. 
We don't, uh, we don't try to measure its size, but we know that we can get it in context. And it gradually we will be getting information continuously in context. And so that universe, um, our universe, our awareness will continue to expand and be reconfiguring the information to match exactly what we need when we need it. So that's, that's a kind of a background, and I want to share with you uh, what that might look like. This is, the, um, this is now almost two years old, I believe. It's a vision video, so it's not really what happens when you wear Project Glass. It's just what um, Google believes we, it, it's striving for, what people need to address their daily life. So I'm going to go ahead and... Um, uh, play this, it's about two and a half minutes, and uh, then I'll continue my talk at the end of this video. Just to give you a taste of what um, might be possible in the future. So you can see the sensors are outside, but I'm getting the information inside. Yeah. Um, meet me in front of Strand Book at 2. By understanding where the person is going. Oh, man. Really? the communication system can instantly reconfigure and provide an alternative route. Hey there, guy. Hey there, little guy. Sweet. Remind me to buy tickets for Monsieur Gano tonight. Many people, many people found this, uh, this video interesting. It was one of the uh, very, very oh, fastest yeah. viral videos. Well, you get the hey, idea. How's it going? Want to go check out that new place I'll tell you about? Sure. Hey, just a second. Cool. Good to see you again. Thanks, man. Got a new place. I'll see you later. See you, dude. Whoa. Cool. Take a photo of this. Share it to my circle. There's some um, ability to communicate with people who are far away, to see them, to have them see us in our, our environment very clearly. Well, that vision video, that vision is very much for use by consumers, by the mass market. There are other people who can also benefit from augmented reality. It's not only um, people who are carrying and purchasing consumer products and services. There are also uh, professional users, and consumers and professional users have different requirements and different tolerances uh, for, for performance and a different willingness to pay. So I'm just using uh, the example of consumers and professional users as one that we can segment the augmented reality industry and the opportunities and the requirements uh, according to the end user's needs. We can also take a completely different uh, approach to segmentation, to better understanding what, uh, what's possible, what's available, by, by using the delivery platform. So um, sometimes we can use augmented reality, we can produce augmented reality experiences using a projector that's mounted in the um, environment or uh, mounted on a vehicle, for example, as in the lower left-hand corner, 
And for uh, many applications, it's appropriate to use a desktop or a kiosk to produce the augmented reality experience. And then, um, as I have in the lower right-hand corner, what's very popular today or increasingly uh, possible is to do augmented reality on a mobile platform like a smartphone or a tablet. When we're on a tablet or a smartphone, we have the sensors that I've spoken of before, the camera as well as the um, uh, location sensors, uh, temperature, altitude, and other sensors. And um, we can start to segment within the mobile augmented reality uh, uh, cluster two different types of AR experiences. The ones that are based on geospatial information with the built-in GPS and compass, and those that are using the camera to extract information from the real world using the video signal. And both of them tend to use the smartphone or, um, or mobile devices, gyroscope, and accelerometer to give better performance and to give more accurate assessment of the user's context. Now, uh, as you might imagine, there are benefits and drawbacks depending on the kind of augmented reality experience that you, uh, the kind of sensors that you're using. So if you're using geospatial, um, there are a lot of geospatial points of interest available, and uh, it's very, very relevant to the user's context. But um, there are also some, some drawbacks. Um, there are a lot of places where GPS doesn't work, and uh, some people don't have access to the geospatial information that is uh, relevant to a particular location or space. And uh, it, it, there, there may also be some, some um, uh, dis, uh, the compass may lose uh, calibration and uh, cause some errors in the experience that people have. On the other hand, the computer vision or camera-based uh, augmented reality experiences uh, also have benefits and drawbacks. The, they don't uh, need to have the location information, and they can certainly use a lot of the digital information that's already been captured. But uh, uh, camera vision uh, uses a lot of uh, computation. It's very, very uh, complicated to extract the features, and it's sometimes hard to get the features out if there's a lot of shadow, if it's dark or very, very bright. Uh, and so there are some uh, compromises. Well, as part of uh, segmenting the world of augmented reality and better understanding and seeing the landscape more clearly and the textures of what's around us, um, a group of people began to um, think about and to define use case categories. And the three that uh, are, are proposed and that are used today are these. I'll be speaking about them a little bit more in each of the next three slides. The guide, publish, and collaborate use case categories help people to um, generalize about the requirements and then also um, to plan ahead for, um, for how they can integrate personal information, and security and other concerns that they may have. The first is, and the most popular, is what we call the guide use case. And this is where an augmented reality experience uh, on the basis of computer vision or geospatial leads a user in a step-by-step -step sequence. It could be a path that I'm traveling in or a, or a process. So I have these figures. It could be a tourist guide application, or it could be how to assemble a piece of furniture, or how to repair a complicated motor. So there are many, many, many uh, guide use cases, and uh, that's most frequently what we get today. In the future, and already there are some platforms that are able to take some of the context and prompt the user to have an opinion or to contribute their own personal information and to attach it or to annotate the physical world, to attach some piece of digital information to something in the physical world. And it could be a person or a place or a thing. And those are called published use cases. And sometimes we think of it as social augmented reality. And when somebody else comes by 
uh, to that same location that has been uh, asked to view a particular experience, they can see their friends or another source's augmented reality ex experience. The third use case category um, is called the collaborate use cases. And this is more complex. It involves two or more people that are interacting in real time with um, the digital world and the physical world. And so this is uh, sometimes we think of it as uh, there are some use cases for this that have games or entertainment use cases. And um, I have an example here in my slide about a particular use case that has to do with, with telemedicine. These two people um, might be at a distance, but they're collaborating and they have, they're sharing digital data and there's also a patient in the room uh, who, who is going to benefit from their collaboration. This is part of a video that was um, created. It's a vision video, just like the Google Glass one, created by Corning Glass. And I invite you to go and visit that. I'll put you the URL um, below. All right, so now I'd like to um, turn to some practical matters and introduce you to just how these augmented reality experiences come about. Um, and it's, uh, there are many parallels between um, augmented reality preparation and preparing the experience content and when one is preparing a web page or designing content for use on the internet. So it still has a very high component of digital information. So just like for a website or a app, software application, it's a developer and there's the physical world. And one of the first things that happens is we need to recognize or to choose those parts of the physical world with which we want to attach or associate some digital information. So I call that, we, we extract the features from the physical world. It could be a geospatial location or it could be some points of interest in an, in an image. And then we, we conserve that, we preserve it in a file. We call that the digital representation of the physical world. It's a mirror of the physical world that's just gone into the digital world. And using authoring tools, augmented reality authoring tools, um, the developer then creates an association between that digital representation, some part of it, a, a trigger is associated with some digital asset, uh, the presentation data, and together these are the augmentations. So there's an association made, and this now can be used to pre pre prepare and to produce an experience. The next thing that happens is that the developer, using their authoring tool or a publishing environment, puts that, those digital data onto a server and uh, prepares it for delivery by the client. Now, this client-server relationship doesn't necessarily limit us to having things be separate by distance. They're not necessary to be a distributed architecture, but it often is a distributed architecture. The server and the client can occupy um, different databases or use different resources on the same device. And then that, uh, when, the, when the user has uh, entered an area or detects, when the user's sensors detect something of interest, a focal point that has previously been scanned or its features extracted, the sensors then uh, pull out some information, and they say, oh, here's some relevant data. Does it match with the trigger data? When the trigger matches the sensor observations, an event happens, and then it calls the presentation information to deliver and to present the augmented reality experience to the end user in the physical world. Now, that last little bit that, that, that uh, I'm going to take a different view of those same processes. Um, as I mentioned, we have to understand that the, in real time, um, there are sensors that are capturing the physical world, and those are called stimuli, and they extract and they say, hey, there's a match here. Um, let's go ahead and uh, find the asset, the digital asset that augmented the, the presentation data and its triggers and retrieve the augmentation. Then to produce the experience, it matches the features to the digital asset, it um, makes some adjustments, and then it renders the digital asset 
onto the person's uh, eyes or ears or in some other way adjusts for the environment and in real time is tracking the changes and correcting and locking the digital asset onto the physical world. And that's what we call a continuous user experience with the uh, augmented reality. Now, the software, I've mentioned the software client application several times. Um, today, um, most augmented reality experiences on mobile platforms use native applications. And those native applications could be standalone or um, they have a plug-in that was provided by an AR uh, publishing platform. So I'll be talking now for the next uh, few minutes about the many, many diverse kinds of applications that you could uh, download onto your device, your tablet or smartphone, and then uh, use in different circumstances. For example, you could use augmented reality to help you find the nearest uh, subway or metro station, or in the case of London, the nearest tube. This was one of the very first applications available for the iPhone. Gosh, I think it's been nearly five years now since this pub was published, and it's been downloaded many millions of times. There are other examples, early examples, as well as more recent ones, like there, this one from IBM, the IBM Seer application, that allows you to find your way and navigate in a sports venue, in this case, the Wimbledon um, uh, Tennis Championships. And so it was providing information to the user in real time uh, that you could consult with the screen down or lift up the phone and it would show you the direction to perhaps some points of interest like the bathrooms or where you could get a taxi uh, and other services. Navigation is a very, very important use case. It's very intuitive for people. However, they really don't want to hold the device up at, arm, at eye level. Um, so what we found is that there are many uh, variations on this theme that are more intuitive or easier on the user. And one of those is certainly to put that navigation information onto a screen that you're wearing or into the windshield of your automobile. Another category of very, very clear use cases that have many benefits is to use uh, this, this technology for helping people make decisions in a retail shopping environment or to engage with products that, they, um, that the, the brand wants them to have a relationship with. So the retail um, experiences are extremely diverse and, and numerous. Some of the early ones uh, were, were developed for watch companies where uh, a boutique would not have the money, the budget necessary to have a full line of these expensive watches, but what they could do is to show the prospective customers what this would look like if they had um, the full stock. Uh, and so what you would do is attach a marker onto the person's wrist, and then using a, a kiosk. Uh, environment, be able to make a choice about the model they wanted to look at and they could uh, try it on. They call this, you know, sort of the virtual, uh, mer the, the magic mirror or the try it on use case. Well, you don't have to just try it on your arm, but you could try it on your face, like what, trying on different glass frame, frames of your glasses or clothes and, um, and, and anything that, that you might want to try. For example, IKEA has been working uh, for several years on giving a more interactive and engaging experience with its catalog. And in the near future, it's not quite available today, but I understand that in a few months, it'll be possible for you to download an application that interacts with the catalog, and then you can take a piece, a, a product from the catalog page and put it right into your living space and see how it would look. And so, um, this is a, a way of giving more information in context so that you can make a purchasing decision. There are also many examples, like in uh, the case of Adidas, where people created campaigns using augmented reality for people to engage with the product, in this case, a shoe. Um, so it's up to the uh, it's limitless, just like the human imagination. 
there are equally many use cases for entertainment. Many augmented reality games are available uh, in the Play Store and the App Store. I encourage you to go and look and see what uh, games types of games you might uh, want to to use. Um, very early on, we tried to. Uh, there were, these are some of the examples of several years ago. Uh, examples of playing with some augmented reality collecting ca cards that people would collect, or with packaging, product packaging, um, really limitless. Augmented reality can have many practical uses too. Um, for example, uh, if you have uh, color blindness, augmented reality might be able to help you overcome that. Um, by changing the color composition. Or if you don't happen to speak the language in the country where you are, you could also use the um, Quest Visual application to uh, translate the signs for you. And this is now available in many languages. And they released, in fact, a Russian language version in conjunction with the uh, uh, recent Olympic Games. There are many, uh, there's a long history, I already mentioned Boeing, but there's a long history of the use of augmented reality in aerospace, uh, aviation, and automotive is one of the industries that has long uh, known about and begun to use augmented reality for the design of vehicles and service and maintenance, and, and uh, also to help consumers make choices about what kinds of trim they want, or the car, the color, or other accessories that they might want to order when they purchase a car. So automotive, I think, is one of the industries that has most deeply integrated augmented reality, and where the general public will um, very likely see more of that in the future. There are also a whole host of examples of augmented reality in the domain of healthcare, wellness, and medicine. Uh, don't need to go into any more detail. You can see those on your screen. Some of them are projection AR. Some of them are kiosks. Some of them are in tablets mounted on booms for surgery. There have been uh, quite a few recent examples of using Google Glass during surgery or using some type of eyewear, for example, to find a patient's vein or you might tap the the surgeon or in the preparation might tattoo some kind of a um, some instructions or a, a marker onto the patient's skin, and then it would be um, a guide for where to make incisions and other um, actions on behalf of the surgeon. There have been many geo uh, many geospatial examples, designing and urban planning. Um, and then maybe planning uh, the use of space on a shelf um, in order to be able to plan uh, for the accordance of colors and shapes of products that will be together on the retail shelf. These are both professional applications of augmented reality. Um, many banking services use augmented reality for helping the, their customers in this case, this is to find the nearest ATM. This was one of the very, very first uh, applications for augmented reality um, five years ago, uh, almost exactly. And I think that um, still today, there, this is a relevant use case, and banks like to have a close relationship and to provide services on a mobile platform and include augmented reality. So in some cases, you might need to see some things in text in a list format that would appear in the order of priority. Or if you're doing a search on geospatial information, such as where is the ATM, you might want to see it on a map. But then you might just list your device and be able to uh, see that in context with your physical surroundings. And that's a, exactly what happens in the real estate use cases. When people are looking for their uh, home, their future home, they might um, do a search and provide, receive a list uh, according to the search criteria that they ask for, or they might see it in a map view or list the device and see um, the places that are nearby. 
And again, these are very, very um, well established. And these are two examples of some of the very earliest um, developments, early AR applications that were created some five or four years ago. Um, the the, the um, military has long been uh, able to use augmented reality and has had the resources and the, the need to have the uh, eyewear, to have a head-mounted display in order for the um, um, soldier to have their hands free to do something else. And so, um, again, many use cases and a lot of money was invested early on and still is being invested by the military for augmented reality uh, to uh, enable the soldier to see where there might be sniper action or where there has been historically some geospatial points of interest. Um, they, they, they can see maps before of a, the schematic of a building before entering and other useful information immediately and in context. Similarly, we might use that. I mentioned the uh, across air nearest tube, but many other public sector agencies, not just to find the underground, but also to help people evacuate in case of an emergency or to um, uh, call before digging to be able to see the invisible pipes beneath the ground or beneath the surface of the ground. Um, many public sector applications and, and huge thousands, tens of thousands of targets of a printed nature have been uh, augmented. These are some examples that have been established in, in the past and are now well proven. Um, and I think that you'll find around you, if you start looking, you'll start to see that there's symbols and calls to action to download an application and uh, to experience the added digital information that's been associated. In fact, um, you can uh, probably think of many, many more use cases, and I would suggest that um, not only those industries I've mentioned, but there are other industries, and in the uh, future, all industries will use AR in some way. So I've just spoken with you about some of the use cases. Now I want to go back to uh, where I introduced this and I spoke about the software client that you could download those native applications from the Play Store or the App Store. Some of those native applications are of a unique type. They're of a specific uh, type called the mobile augmented reality browsers. And what they do is they use the browser pro provider's proxy service um, to redirect your, your request or the search query. And all that content stays on the content owner's website. And this is, these mobile AR browsers um, can have really a, a much greater diversity of content. And they resemble, in many ways, the way we think of web browsers. And indeed, in the near future, and already today, in certain circumstances, you can begin to use a mobile web browser to, um, to deliver an augmented reality experience as long as your publisher or the developer of the AR experience has used some of the um, uh, scripts and uh, libraries that support augmented reality and control the opacity or the background of the screen or the web, the web page in this case. So the, uh, there are many different ways of uh, Accessing augmented reality, the mobile AR browsers are an easy place to begin, and so I'd like to encourage people to um, uh, be thinking about that as you sign off and uh, go about your day. Next time that you're um, on your mobile device, perhaps you'll want to download one of these three very popular um, uh, these very popular browsers: um, Layer, Genio and Wikitude are the names of these browsers. And together, there are over 50 million of these uh, uh, instantiations out there. Now, that's not to say there are 50 million users. Only a fraction of those people who have um, downloaded or who have a pre-installed, because it was pre-installed by the manufacturer of their device, have actually started to use those 
products or those software applications to discover augmented reality around them. So uh, there are many other uh, mobile AR browsers that are less well known and less widely adopted. Um, and I think that this segment uh, uh, is, creates a, a very nice ecosystem so that developers don't have to um, create content publishers don't have to create a standalone application. They can reuse an application that already exists. That lowers the barrier to entry for the content publisher. Well, speaking of barriers to entry, I want to um, recommend that you join us uh, uh, for other uh, webinars and events as part of this series, um, because even though our time is almost up, um, there's still a lot of things to talk about and a lot of things that are unknown to be defined about the augmented reality um, universe, the industry. One of the concerns that we're going to be speaking about on March 28th uh, during a Google Hangout is uh, the topic of privacy and personal data. How is that protected? And is it possible to have very contextually aware services and at the same time have um, the ability to control your private data. So where is that line and uh, how is it drawn? We'll be hearing from some panelists who are experts in the area of privacy, um, software architecture, privacy by design, and um, also uh, the legal uh, domains. Well, um, I think that that about wraps it up. I've uh, left a little bit of time in case there are any questions. Um, you can uh, see that, uh, to summarize, um, augmented reality is something that seems new to many of us, but it's actually been around for quite a long time, and its growth is very steady, and having augmented reality be part of our daily lives is pretty, pretty inevitable. Uh, so it's time to start getting, um, getting acquainted with it if you, if you uh, have time. You can see that augmented reality takes advantage of many key enabling technologies in our mobile platforms, our communications networks, and uh, on the web. I've talked about the use case categories. I spoke about some of the industries, and in the end, uh, the conclusion that I suggest, uh, uh, the conclusion I have is that all industries will benefit from the adoption of AR to some degree. So um, I recommend that you download one of those AR browsers uh, and uh, to try it for yourself when you find one of those calls to action, probably on a, a print, um, a magazine or a newspaper or maybe a, a product packaging. Um, the mobile AR browsers also have support for geospatial augmented reality, and there you don't need to have a particular product. You can just go outside and lift up your tablet and rotate it until you see some of those generic, some of those points of interest will appear on your screen. So that's uh, where I'd like to close today. I'd like to invite you again to um, come return. We'll be having some more of these webinars. You can find out more on the IEEE. Standards Association Google Plus page about our meeting next week and uh, the following webinars in April. If you have any questions, you can use the chat feature on the WebEx to put those. I will be able to see those uh, appearing. And um, I wish you all a very, very nice day. I also um, want to give you my uh, contact information. If you'd like to follow up with me directly, feel free to do so. Thank you very much. David, how are we doing? Do we still have some time? Are there any questions or um, any comments you'd like to discuss? Uh, thanks, Christine. Uh, great job. Uh, I don't see any uh, questions coming through to myself. Uh, or the group in general. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, close out this webinar. I appreciate everybody for their participation today. And uh, I want to thank Christine again for her presentation. Uh, and again, I invite you next week on Friday, March 28th at 12 noon Eastern to join another Google 
um, excuse me, a Google Hangout presentation that we're doing with some um, some experts in the AR and privacy space that Christine mentioned. Again, just check out the uh, IEEE Standards Association Google Plus page for more info. And uh, I think that's going to conclude our webinar. Thanks, everybody. And uh, thank you. Thank you, you David. Time. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye.